I need some traction. Awesome, so thank you guys for coming out today. I really appreciate it. And just to give you a background of who I am and why I'm here. Uh, so I started in technical marketing around five years ago. I left college to found a startup. It was an online publication. At the time, you had zero resources online to really teach you any marketing. Uh, but at the same time, social media was a fair game, right? Facebook didn't have any rules. Instagram didn't have any rules. Now they're cracking down on tons of different types of automation. But at that time, you could really do something if you started, and anybody could do it. So I created a publication from scratch, recruited 150 writers, um, and I did it through Facebook messaging. You can message anybody you wanted on Facebook as long as you had a friend in common. So we had four founders. We messaged probably close to 100,000 people, and that's how we were able to recruit all the writers. At that time, uh, to get someone to view a blog post from a Facebook ad, it cost less than a cent. So we had 24,000 visitors a day. Uh, and we were just fresh out of college. We had no idea what we were doing. All we knew is we had some growth hacks and they were working. And that was awesome. It was my first jump into building a community. I tried to get our writers to produce more, create a CMS system for them. And that was all awesome until we couldn't figure out how to monetize. Because we were fresh out of college and we didn't understand anything about picking a niche. We were elite daily for travel, health, uh, and tons of different other types of content. And before we knew it, um, we ran out of money. So what ended up happening was, I was like, OK, well, let me go work with some people who know what they're doing. And it turned out that there was a big mobile app craze. And if you know, like four years ago, people were just throwing money at mobile app startups. They're like, oh my gosh, you are a mobile app? Here's money. And that's how it was working. Uh, so we had, uh, I was the co-founder slash VP of marketing of a company called Enjoyment. They were Tinder for jobs. You swipe right, and you can get a job. We'll apply to a job. And horrible idea. <laughs> But, and the company did end up failing six months later down the road. The um, reason I took the job was because I was going to be working with people from Google, McKinsey, Amazon. And I was like, these people must know what they're doing, right? They worked for all these big companies. And the truth is, very few people know what they're doing in startups. So you have maybe one of the co-founders. He came from Google, but his job as a software engineer was to prevent, pe prevent spam from getting into a certain part of Gmail. It's not going to help you in the startup world, right? Um, so these companies are huge. And there's a lot that goes on to a startup that doesn't happen in a corporate company. So as soon as I got disillusioned with that, um, I was really upset. I felt like I wasted like, several years of my life in startups. And I had a breakdown. I was like, what am I doing? Am I ever going to work for a startup again? Um, so I worked 10 months as a copywriter. And little did I know that would become one of the best skills I have today. And I saved up enough money to where I was like, OK, I'm going to take one more leap into startup life. And I worked for this Facebook marketing software company. They put me on contract because I had a lot of skills. Uh, they're like web dev, copywriting. Uh, I've been featured in a lot of publications. And um, you helped get a ton of mobile app users. Uh, all that seems cool, not really relevant to our product, but it looks like you can do stuff. And little did I know that this company would be the first to live stream on Facebook. And this is how I became known for a while, is that we were working with some of the most cutting edge technology. But at the same time, what I found out is that it didn't matter. Uh, and what I mean by that is, in the tech mega of the world, which is San Francisco, they don't care about how many years you put into marketing, how many years you put in entrepreneurship, whether you're a co-founder, whether you founded you know, two million ARR companies. You're still gonna be competing for an entry-level job with someone who went to Stanford and spent a year at Google. It's just how it is. And this was a really big pain point for me. So I was like, why does it have to be this way? And as I was struggling to get a job in San Francisco, even though I previously was a co-founder, I taught myself web dev, um, and I was working at one of the most cutting-edge startups. They didn't care. There was no brand name that I was attached to. So what I had to do to separate myself is take a month off, and I wrote a 250-page book about Facebook marketing. And that was sort of this point in my life where I said, OK, if this book gets me a job in San Francisco, I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to crush it. And then I came to San Francisco a year ago, um, and within around seven months, I built a community of over 10,000 marketers and founders, now the most active community online for this niche. And part of it was that I realized how disillusioned like, the whole startup scene was, that nobody was actually providing real tactics. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you go to growthhackers.com, you go to inbound, you're not really finding great content to help your startup. You're finding case studies of how Uber grew, right? And it's 2,000 words long. That's not going to help you get your first 10 customers. It's not going to help you get your first 100 customers. And then you go to inbound. It's like five ways to do X. And I was like, this is the best content that's out there. This makes no sense to me. And as someone who's been working in technical marketing, I knew a lot of good content that I already had 
that people could really benefit from in the startup world. And this is why I think so many startups struggle today, is that the content online is just so poor that um, people are just consuming all this bad content and trying to jump onto every channel. They're like, okay, we'll jump on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Quora, and just see what works, right? And that's not how you should do it. Um, you find one channel, you try to hone in on it, make sure it works, and then you go to another channel. And all the content they're putting out is really, really bad, to be honest. And it's so bad to the point where I've tried a lot of what they've done and a lot of what they said you should do, and it just doesn't work. And it, I made it my mission to go to every single channel, find out what does work, reverse engineer it, dominate the platform, and then tell people how I did it. So in one year, to give you some idea, is in one year I became the top writer on Quora. I have close to 10 million views on the platform. And not only that, I went from having an average engagement of like five likes per LinkedIn status to close to 200. And that's posting on LinkedIn every single day and getting that type of engagement. And then I built the Facebook group, which has over 12,000 people in it today. It is one of the most active Facebook groups online. And how I know that is Facebook invited me out to their Facebook community summit, which is happening uh, this month. And it's, I believe, on the 17th. And they took the 100 of the top Facebook groups and they said, OK, we're going to bring you out so you can tell us how to improve our platform. And I find that so fascinating because it made me realize that communities are so hard to build, right? And if they took 100 of the top Facebook groups, and my community is one of them, and I did that in seven months, then what about all these other communities that exist? Like, are they even good, right? Um, and that's why when you go to these Facebook groups and you look at what's in them, what's getting posted, in these communities. Most of it's like, click on this so you can read my blog post. Click on this so you can attend this event. And then you never go back. And a lot of it's also Q&A, right? So you have someone that says, hey, I need help with Google Analytics and setting up goals. And that doesn't apply to 99% of the people in the group. So when they see that, they'll never come back to your community. You need content that actually creates an addictive cycle, right? It's similar to, have you guys read the book by Nir Eyal? By raise your hands. So many of you guys have read it. And this applies to everything you do online. So if you post content on your social media profile, whether it be Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Quora, and someone goes there and they don't enjoy that content and they're not getting rewarded, the next time they see your notification, they're less likely to go. And this was huge. I was like, what if I just treat this as an email notification where every time they see a notification by me, they're more likely to click on it. So, you know, how did I get here? I talked a little bit about this already, but one of the big things is nobody would really know who I am if I didn't host 80 events in the last year. Um, and I hosted events with the co-founder of Zapier, the head of growth for Grammarly, um, almost all the top companies in Silicon Valley, and are bringing all these people. And part of it was I just wanted to understand, you know, how did they think about growing startups? And who did they turn to when they needed help? And what I found out is that they didn't go online and they didn't read blog posts. Almost all of them said the same thing. We go to the source. We, found someone, we find people who are on the front lines, who are crushing it, who are actually doing the work right now, and we ask them. And I find that really fascinating because most people are stuck online. They're reading all this content in their Facebook newsfeed. Uh, they're going to all these different blogs. And they walk away with nothing. Yet all the best founders, all the best marketers are just talking to people who are already doing it. And so much about it is just relationship building. But nobody really likes to focus on relationships in a world of online marketing, right? We all think that it just has to be done via Twitter, mentioning people, or just posting stuff on LinkedIn, and it has to be through blog posts. And that to me just sounded so strange after interviewing all these people saying, we don't do any of that stuff. And the best content creators I know, and this may, for the people that do SEO in this room, it may be very counterintuitive, but the best content creators I know don't focus at all on SEO. They focus on creating remarkable content. Just through creating remarkable content, you'll get backlinks. And it sounds very uh, different than what you're used to hearing, but the truth is that you can spend the next six months trying to build your sales funnel for a startup, and then realize you have no relationships built and have no users or customers. Or what you could do is you could build relationships with prospects, build thousands and thousands of those relationships over the next six months, and then when you're going to launch on Product Hunt, you'll be the number one. And that's what people often forget, that online marketing is not really about building sales funnels at all. It is about building relationships. And if you can build enough relationships fast enough and do it in scalable ways, then you can sell. 
And I focus heavily on Facebook because Facebook is the fastest platform to build your know, like, and trust factor. It's a frictionless sales funnel. And what do I mean by this? If you add someone as a friend, you can invite them to a Facebook group, you can invite them to an event, and you could direct message them. I mean, it's great. If you send an email to somebody, maybe they might open it, maybe you have a 30% open rate, 2% click-through rate, and you're not getting them to convert. And that's why bots have become really big, especially chatbots, because you have like a 90% open rate when you're messaging people on Facebook. And not only that, people know that they can't get added to a random list on Facebook, right? It's not gonna be some random fan page messaging them, they have to opt in. It's huge. And what I realized too, I said, well, I saw some other people that I was following, and these people were making seven figures just by having a Facebook profile. They weren't active on LinkedIn, they weren't active on Instagram, they weren't active on Quora, they would do a post on Facebook and they would get maybe five to 10 clients from it. And I found this so fascinating. I was like, wow, there's this whole world out there of social media selling that nobody's taking advantage of. And people were using this for B2C, they were using it for B2B, and I said, okay, what if I tried this out? And so I looked at what they're doing, and I figured out, hey, there's only several people in the space. There has to be easy for me to become better than them. And all I have to do is look at what they do and just do it better um, and reverse engineer it. And that's what I did. So as we go along, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. I'll be more than happy to answer them. So I'll peri periodically stop at slides like this and just let me know. So before you reach out to anybody, the hardest thing is actually optimizing your social profile for who your desired avatar is regarding your prospect, regarding your customer. Now, if you think about what company you work for, and I'll give you an example. I was the evangelist for Autopilot, their marketing automation company. Um, now I'm the evangelist for Mixmax, or another marketing automation company. And they're two of the fastest growing software companies in San Francisco. And I was able to make them hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales through optimizing my social profile and building communities online. And when I think of a prospect for a marketing automation company, I think of maybe a VC because they have a lot of portfolio companies that are looking for new technology. I think of the head of growth for companies, I think of digital marketers, and I think of people who like to attend events like these ones, right? And I said, okay, well, how do I optimize my profile so they add me back if I reach out to them? Because guess what, if you have 5,000 friends on Facebook and they're all potential prospects and you're writing a lot of content and you're putting a lot of value out there, you could put a post up and you can sell. And what do I mean by that? One example would be, and I'll go through the exact post a little later, is I put a post up on Facebook basically asking people to jump on a free trial in exchange for some value I was providing them, this folder of growth hacks. And I made over $200,000 in sales for a B2B company in less than a week from one single Facebook post. Now, nobody's talking about this because nobody's doing it. And if you think about it, you go to your Facebook newsfeed, you go to your LinkedIn newsfeed, and chances you're seeing horrible content all day long. And you're just wondering, you're like, oh, like, why do I keep going back? And they have you sucked in, right? You don't really have a choice but to look at your newsfeed. And as much as you try to avoid it, you get maybe Newsfeed Eradicator, if you guys know of that Chrome extension, so it blocks out your newsfeed. And you still like go on your phone though, and you're still looking at it, and they have you in this addictive loop. So people, as much as they don't want to admit it, they're still looking at their newsfeed, and it's horrible content, but one day, they come across, and they see a piece of content that's actually good. And they're like, wow, this guy's writing about his story in a way that I've never seen. And he's being very personable, and he's writing about his work, he's writing about like his loved ones, and they stop and they go, who is this guy? And then the next week they see another post from you. And you're building rapport with them. And it's so easy because you're competing against junk, right? So your post is the only good one the thousands are seeing every day. So if you know your networking avatar, and these are actually some of the people that are speaking at the event today, and I was able to connect with through Facebook. You have Dennis Yu, who's uh, Facebook ads genius. You have Sean Shepard, who's a VC at GrowthX. You have Hitesh Parashar, who's uh, another VC at GrowthX. And you have George Robutsky, who helped grow Lyft. He helped grow Soothe. He helped grow WAG. These are some of the biggest marketplace companies in the world. And I connected through all, to all of them through Facebook. And to me, these are some of the people that are so hard to get in touch with, yet here I was in San Francisco with no network, connecting with these people within the first month I was there. And it was because I made myself look like someone they should connect with. So my Facebook profile had a number of triggers. Hyperlocal, people like to connect with other people 
who have an attachment to their city. So if you live in San Francisco and you see a Facebook ad and it has a picture of your city, then you're more likely to stop because you have an affinity towards it. So I said, if I have a cover photo that's of San Francisco, and now it's a cover of photo of me speaking at the NASDAQ, so it's a little bit different, still pulls a lot of triggers. But when I was connecting to people in San Francisco, it's a picture of San Francisco, so they're more likely to stop, more likely to have emotional connection to my profile. And then influencer. So do I have followers? Am I posting content where influencers are engaging with it? Am I taking video with them and posting that on my newsfeed? And am I a speaker? They want to connect to other people who speak at events because they regularly speak at events. Most influencers rarely attend events. They only speak at events because they don't have time to attend. And then a helper. This is really big. The best influencers you want to connect to are people who love helping. What does this mean? This means responding to people who comment on your posts and actually answering their questions because that in itself is an addictive loop. So what happens when people start seeing you respond to comments on your post? Well, they realize, they're like, wow, so if I comment again, he's probably going to respond to it. So you start going from two comments on your post to five to 10, and then all of a sudden you're at 30 comments on every post that you're printing up because people know you'll respond. And this seems like a waste of time to most people, but you're building rapport. And again, if you're connected to VCs, head of growth, digital marketers, and these are prospects, um, you're building relationships, and these people will buy from you, and they'll talk about you. They'll talk about you offline, they'll talk about you online, and before you know it, you're creating this entire brand. Because how is a brand created? It's when two customers or two prospects talk to each other about you. It's not what you tell your prospects, it's not what you tell your customers, it's what they say when they're in conversation with each other about you. So in order to create a great profile and really dominate social media, there is this problem. And what is it? It's you have to drive content, or you have to drive traffic to content, and you have to post epic content. And you got to do this every single day. Now, I love creating great content, and I will do that every day. I've created 1,200 pieces of content in the last year. And, but if I have to go tweet out my article, then it just like kills me. I find it the most boring thing in the world. I'd rather not do that at all. So what I do is I growth hack the distribution part. And that way, I don't have to focus on it at all. So I have all these marketers out there that are saying, hey, like 90% distribution, 10% content, total BS. It's 90% content, maybe 95, and 5% distribution. You either growth hack distribution or you create content that's so good to where people will just share it. Um, and now, I can say that that's true because I run the most active community of marketers and founders around one particular type of content, and that's startup tactics. So it was really interesting when I got to San Francisco and I was looking for help from founders, from VCs, from digital marketers, and looking for the right content. I couldn't find any of it. Um, and there's no step-by-step -step guides, right? Maybe Moz has some step-by-step -step guides, but that's really it. And to me, I thought it was so strange because you have hundreds of thousands of founders that are looking for content to grow their startups, yet there's none of it online. And I said, okay, what if I just created remarkable content and drove some traffic to it through like growth hacking? Not a ton, but just some. And just what would happen? So I created some remarkable pieces of content. It's like how to automate your Instagram profile to 45K followers in a year. I worked at a company called Upout. I was their head of growth. Uh, in three months while I was there, automated set of their Instagram profiles. was on track to get us $200,000 in revenue. Um, automated a lot of my other job, and I got bored, so I ended up working at a VC firm. I'll go into that in just a bit. Um, and nobody knows about this content because nobody's talking about it. Most people who are growth hackers or growth marketers who know all these secrets, they don't like creating content. It's like, I know this secret, and maybe they know two or three secrets, and they just don't want to let it out. And to me, I was like, well, I'm just going to tell everybody because there's hundreds of thousands of starving, starving founders, starving marketers. They deserve this. And it makes it much, much easier to start growth hacking or distribution if you have an unfair advantage. And how many of you guys use Upwork here by a show of hands? So actually, not too many of you guys. And imagine if I told you that I knew nothing about coding, but yet I could build a Chrome extension, well, outsource a Chrome extension, that can give me 10 to 20 unfair advantages with social media. It could allow me to do Facebook messaging at scale. It could allow me to do LinkedIn connection, connecting at scale. It could allow me to export people from Quora to get their emails. I could even go to um, start doing LinkedIn messaging with personalized messages, spin syntax, so it's a different message every single time. And it only cost me $1,500 on Upwork to outsource this tool. 
And it's so funny because now I have 10 unfair advantages that no other social media marketer is using, and yet I have those. Just one would guarantee, guarantee me a job. 10, like I'll always have a job, right? And I'll always have work, and I'll use it for my clients, and they'll think I'm a genius. But it's not true. I paid $1,500 on Upwork, and I don't know how to write a line of code. I just said I want something that does X and looks like X. And within around a month, I got this back. And people don't realize how easy it is to get in touch with the best talent today. So it really behooves me that you have people in San Francisco who are founders. And it's a shame that they'll only hire local talent. And the best companies I know love to have remote talent because you can hire the best developer in the world if you use Upwork, if you use Freelancer. But San Francisco companies would be like, I want to hire someone in San Francisco. And because they're in San Francisco and I want them on my team, and it's a little bit of a control problem, to be honest. Because I interview people who have all remote teams. You know, you have Buffer, you have Zapier, and when I was talking to the co-founder of Zapier, and their whole entire team is remote, he says, I can't believe that more people aren't doing this because no longer do we have to be limited by city when we're hiring a developer, but we can hire the best developer and he's in the Ukraine and cost one-fourth the amount that it costs in San Francisco. And then we'll go ahead and hire four of them. And people say, what, what about culture? You know, culture is so important. Well, there's companies that have all remote teams that just figure out how to solve that issue, right? It's just another problem that you're trying to solve. So they have get-togethers almost, let's say, like twice a year. They have people on regular calls to make sure that they're right culture fit, that they understand the culture, and then they're growing as fast as they are, right? Zapier is one of the fast-growing companies, um, absolutely skyrocketed. And it's not so much they have a great product but what does their product rely on? Their product relies on integrations. They want to acquire more users. They don't put up more blog posts. They add another integration. And in order to add another integration, what do you need? You need the best developers in the world. And you're not going to get the best developers in the world in San Francisco. As much as people think that they're all in San Francisco, it's not true. The world is really big. Um, and through that, they have their unfair advantage. So there are so many ways to get your unfair advantage. And the biggest arbitrage right now is using sites like Upwork, it's using sites like Freelancer. Because I could pay $1,500 for a tool and then be considered one of the best social media experts, and that's simply not true. I just know how to post a, a job posting online. That's it. And what ends up happening once you have ton, 10 unfair advantages? Well, you can multiply it. So there's a tool called DuckSoup. And how many of you guys know of 